Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Princeton Preservation Group's Susan Schwartzberg Memorial Lecture Series. My name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am the curator for the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music at Monmouth University. I have the pleasure of helping the Princeton Preservation Group just with the tech for these events. So if you have any trouble with your Zoom throughout the evening, please go ahead and drop me a message in the chat. Um, with that brief message, I will turn things over to our real host for this evening, Mr. Gary Suretsky. Um, many of you know Gary as the longtime Monmouth County archivist, and today he is wearing his Princeton Preservation Group hat. So he'll tell you, literally, right? <laughs> so he'll tell you all about that and kick things off for this evening. Hope you enjoy. Gary? Thank you, Melissa, and welcome, everyone. Um, the Princeton Preservation Group was started by Susan Schwartzberg, uh, the preservation librarian at Rutgers. And we're, this year, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary. Uh, Susan taught classes in the preservation of library materials, and she would invite people to give talks to the students and to each other on a wide range of preservation topics. And since then, uh, the group has been meeting uh, several times a year, and uh, we've had talks on uh, photographs, as we are this evening, but also on preservation of houses, uh, preservation of artwork, paintings, books, uh, preservation of historic districts, uh, preservation of Lucy the Elephant and carpets. And uh, we've had talks on disaster planning and disaster recovery. Um, so anything that's related to the preservation of cultural materials uh, is, is a topic that we welcome um, having talks on. Uh, so if any of you are interested in giving a talk, um, we'd, I'd be glad to hear from you. I, I can be contacted through the Princeton Preservation Group webpage, which has a list of all the prior meetings, and there will be a link there to the video of tonight's recording. And it also has a membership form. If you'd like to be a member, uh, dues are $5 a year. And that gets you on the mailing list, and uh, so you know about all the events. And uh, we also have some member-only events from time to time. But our, our regular meetings are open to anyone. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. We're calling this a Susan Schwartzberg Memorial Lecture. When we have students give talks, we call it that. And when we have uh, other people talking, we don't call it Susan Schwartzberg Lecture. Uh, our two speakers, uh, you've probably read about them when you registered, but I'll just uh, say briefly that uh, they are both uh, third year library and archives conservation students at the Winter Tour University of Delaware program in art conservation. Uh, currently, Johanna Pinney is doing a internship at Dartmouth Library. And Katerina Stiller is now doing an internship at the University of Iowa. So our speakers are coming to us from Iowa and Rhode Island. No, I'm sorry, not Rhode Island, New Hampshire <laughs> this evening. And uh, we welcome them as well as all the other people here in attendance. So I'm happy to turn it over to them and we look forward to hearing your talk. Great, thank you so much, Gary. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so again, thank you so much for tuning into today's tin type talk. As Gary said, I'm Katerina Stiller, and today me and my classmate Johanna Penny will be talking about a project that we worked on together as master students for the Winterthur University of Delaware Program for Art Conservation. So here we are in tin type form. First, a little overview of what to expect. First, we're going to go into a bit about the history of the tin type, including when it was used in comparison to other photographic foam rats. Then we're going to touch on a bit on what the photo tin type photography process entails and what the material components are. We will note some common identify identifying characteristics of a tin type, including types of deterioration commonly seen. 
Then we will introduce the project itself, the signs um, of the deterioration we were seeing with the photos and the type of research we conducted in order to gather more information on tintype conservation. Then we'll walk through the final treatment and the results, including the housing that was made for the plates. And then we will wrap up with some reflections. So tintypes are a direct positive uh, photographic process that was first patented in the US in 1856, and it continued to be popular until the early 1900s. They were cheaper and easier to produce than earlier, photo earlier photographic processes such as the daguerreotype, making them quite popular with a wide range of sitters and photographers throughout the 19th century. The flexibility of the process also allowed for more creativity with people creating ghost images and other portraits with a more artistic flair. This was certainly not the first time that people created these types of images, but tintypes definitely made it easier. So as previously stated, the tintypes were a very accessible process. On this slide is a map showing just some of the studios that were set up in Philadelphia after the 1850s. And I think you can probably extrapolate this to most major towns and cities around the US during this time. We were lucky that one of the tintypes in the collection we treated had the remnants of a label. This showed that the photograph was most likely taken in Philadelphia. For the first time in history, photography was not limited to the upper, mostly white population. People from all backgrounds were able to both capture images of their loved ones and participate in the photography economy. While many of the sitters' names are no longer known, it should be emphasized that this boom in interest in the art of photography played a role in later developments like uh, film, handheld cameras, and yes, the selfie. So tintypes were an integral part of early photography. The first development was the daguerreotype, but the ambrotype soon followed in 1854. The tintype was patented just a couple years later. These early plate-based photographs had many similar characteristics uh, and their individual development was heavily influenced by the other types. Uh, as I said, amber types were patented just two years before the tintype and share many of the same development features. The main difference is that instead of having a metal support, amber types are a negative on glass. To see the positive image, the plate needs to be placed on a dark background. Many amber types had hand color added to emphasize features such as the sitter's eyes, cheeks, or accessories. The plate made them a little more delicate than the metal-based photographs, and the image layers were more susceptible to damage. They were generally kept in cases while tintypes were more mobile. And tintype photography is still done today, and not much has really changed in terms of the materials and techniques used. It's quite likely you might even live near a studio or two that does tintype photography. There are also traveling tintype photographers who do pop-up photo shoots, which is how Joe and I came across tintype photography first in Philadelphia, which we'll go into more later on. So a little bit about what actually is a tintype. Uh, here we have a cross section of a tintype plate. They are made with a metal support, traditionally iron, which is coated on both sides with a black varnish. On one side, collodion with silver halides is added. This is poured on as a liquid and allowed to dry. Once the photographer was ready to take a picture, the plate was made light sensitive by putting it in a bath of silver nitrate. After exposure, water stopped the development and potassium cyanide was used as a fixer. Finally, a layer of varnish was added to protect the plate. And to get a little bit more into the materials themselves, the black varnish layers were historically made with tar and oil and a black pigment. Even when this process was being developed, it was common for photographers to buy plates with the collodion already applied and they would just have to sensitize them when they were ready. Uh, and this remains true today. The metal plate was generally made of iron 
uh, in modern times, this has shifted to stainless steel to avoid some of the in issues inherent in iron, such as rusting. The tones within the image are created by the different concentrations of silver, more in the highlights, almost none in the dark areas. There are a few characteristics that help differentiate between tintypes and other types of photography. Generally, the blacks were a very glossy and deep due to the absence of silver, while the lighter areas tended towards a gray. They are flatter than amber types, don't have as much dimensionality, and the plate has a black coating. The black lacquer is an integral part of the process and therefore a good indicator of a tintype. Also, historically, the plate would be magnetic. You also may be able to see some rust or creasing in the plate indicating that it is made from iron. So sometimes identifying common types of deterioration of tintypes can also help with confirming their identification. So given that the base support of a tintype is a, just a thin iron plate, often small enough to fit in one's pocket, creasing of the iron support is a very common type of deterioration as the tintype can be very easily bent and folded. Scratches can also form from these kinds of mechanical manipulations and unvarnished tintypes are even more vulnerable to this type of damage. Rust is one of the more serious types of deterioration seen with tintypes and it typically occurs from poor environmental conditions. This can, occur, this can occur where the bare metal plate is exposed, and this is usually seen at the edges of the plate or where there is cracking or loss of the collodion and lacquer layers. Rust, in turn, can lead to further loss of the lacquer and collodion layers, and dust can also contribute to rust formation as it retains moisture. Filiform corrosion is a very specific type of iron corrosion. It looks like these irreg irregular raised thin wormy lines. The head of these trails is the site of active corrosion, which moves through the iron support, leaving behind a trail of corrosion products that push up the lacquer and collodion layers sitting just above. This type of corrosion appears only, in only, only to be active in environments with high humidity, which is about 58% uh, relative humidity or higher. Flaking, cracking, and loss of the collodion lacquer layers is also common, which can occur from poor handling and environmental conditions. Collodion and lacquer can also just be inherently unstable if they were not prepared properly when they were originally made, which can make, it, make them even more susceptible to flaking. While the varnish layer can help protect the layers underneath, it, it, it itself is also susceptible to deterioration. Discoloration, crazing, and blanching can occur, affecting the visibility of the image underneath. And because the varnish and collodion layers aren't necessarily very distinct, it can be difficult or even impossible to remove a varnish layer without removing the collodion layer with it. So now that we know a bit more about recognizing tintypes, we can get into a specific tintype collection. So in 2022, Winterthur Library acquired 15 tintype photographs in an online auction. They were sent to the Winterthur Library Lab for rehousing, where it was soon determined that many of the photos would require some level of stabilization first. Winterthur Library is an independent research library dedicated to the understanding and appreciation of artistic, cultural, social, and intellectual history of the Americas in a global context from the 17th to the 20th centuries. It's open year round to students, researchers, and the general public by appointment. So it was important for these photographs to be made stable enough to be available to access while retaining the original image as much as possible. The plates are known as sixth plate sized, which is about three and a quarter by two and three quarter inches, which was perhaps one of the more common sizes for tintypes at its time. The photos are studio portraits depicting black Americans in formal wear and their identities are not known. This, this was a period of time since photography was becoming easier and more accessible, where we do start seeing more Black Americans both sitting for portraits and setting up their own photo studios. The photograph 
in general really helped enable people to have more control over their own narrative and very much was and still is a tool for social change and self-empowerment. Because of the unique social and historical value of the collection, Winterthur's art conservation program was very interested in getting these photos stabilized enough for greater access and thus to generate future research and understanding. So the plates exhibited deterioration characteristics quite common for tin type photographs. This included overall corrosion of the iron plate as well as filiform corrosion. There was also flaking and cracking of the lacquer and clothing layers resulting in image loss. Additionally, there was discoloration, crazing, and blanching of the varnish layer, and there was overall surface dirt. Developing a treatment plan for these photos first involved a fair amount of research and discussion of past published studies on tintype cleaning and consolidation. Karina Beeman's case study on tintype consolidation was a partic for particularly useful starting point. We especially got a lot of advice from the nearest photo conservators around. Uh, Zach Long at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts and our classmate Ashley Stanford. We also conducted testing on Winterthur's study collection tintype samples, which were available for student testing. And also during our research rabbit hole, we also went into how tin types were and still are made. We took a wet plate collodion workshop at the Victorian Photography Studio in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. In conservation, model making is practiced to, to demonstrate and exemplify historic techniques, as well as to better understand the history of that material process. Models are also useful test subjects for testing out treatment and housing techniques. Before this, uh, Joe and I were certainly used to making models for books. So while making photo, photo models was a new format for us, the motivations and uses were quite familiar. The entire process listed here for making a wet plate Floodian photo happens in about 15 to 20 minutes total. And things really haven't changed much in the last 150 years. We did use aluminum plates and electric, electric lights do, do come in handy, but we were also able to shoot outside as well using natural lighting. While there is definitely a learning curve to it, as with any craft, I could understand why it was quite popular. It's a relatively straightforward process, producing a finished photo that was quite, quite quick for its time. And it was also quite straightforward to sit for a photograph, which would take about 10 to 20 seconds. And you can actually blink during that. You do have to use, you do have to have a dark room close by since the photos need to be developed on site. But this can be a fairly rudimentary setup. Uh, and here's a process video of a plate in water being transferred to a fixer bath of potassium cyanide. The fixer removes any unexposed silver halide from the plate, leaving behind the reduced metallic silver that forms the image. So now that we've learned what we could about the tin, about tin types, it was time to get back to the project at hand. With treating the photographs, they were dry cleaned with soft brushes and cotton swabs. Dry cleaning is important as it helps remove dirt and grime, which can attract moisture and affect the visibility of the image. This must be done with great care as it is, it is quite easy to scratch or abrade the tin type surface. Different solvents were tested first on sample tin types from Winterthur's study collection to see how they might affect the iron, lacquer, collodion, and varnish layers, as well as their efficacy at removing, removing grime. After some spot testing, it was determined that additional swabbing with deionized water could help remove more deeply embedded dirt and grime. 
Then a microscalpel was used under a stereo microscope to reduce rust on the exposed metal plate, taking care not to scratch or burnish the metal underneath. After cleaning, bare metal was sealed with Paraloid B72 and toluene. This was chosen after testing a variety of solvents on test tin types from the Winterthur study collection. Toluene is an aromatic hydrocarbon that is colorless and might more typically be found in a paintings conservation lab than a library conservation lab. Despite toluene never having made its way into Winterthur's library lab before this project, it had the best balance of flow and evaporation of the solvents we tested without solubilizing the other layers. Paraloid B72 is a clear thermoplastic acrylic resin that is commonly used in art conservation for coatings, consolidants, and adhesives. It is quite stable, non-yellowing, and can be dissolved in a range of solvents. The lifting lacquer and collodion layers were also consolidated with Paraloid B72 and toluene, which was fed in at the edges of the losses and cracks. Whenever solvents were used in this project, portable ventilators were also used and respirators were worn as a precaution since toluene is quite toxic when inhaled. The consolidant did give the bare metal a slightly darker matte appearance after it was applied. This, this change was considered acceptable as it significantly stabilized the photograph overall and reduced the risk of further image loss. Here is an example of what the plates looked like once their conservation treatment was completed. The rust is reduced and the lifting flakes have been set back down. The change is subtle, but most importantly, these plates are now stable enough to be viewed and interacted with. We were generally able to make the image a little more legible. The contrast was improved and the rust is no longer distracting the viewer from the people in the photograph. This is one of the plates that was greatly improved by the cleaning. Uh, the, the darks are deeper and her face is much more visible. We really wanted to make sure that these tintypes would be more accessible to researchers. Beyond any of our treatment steps, creating new housings was the best way to do this. Even though we did a lot of consolidation, the surfaces remained vulnerable. To prevent our new housings from rubbing against the surface, Z trays, uh, named for the shape of the mylar, were made out of polyester film. This created basically a spring that would keep things off the surface. The G Z trays had layers of matte board on either side with windows cut in them. The opening made it so that both sides of the plate could be viewed safely. The next layer was UV filtering acrylic, again, on both sides. These packages were finished with marble seal, which is a heat activated tape, basically, set down with a heated spatula. Besides holding all the components together, the marble seal created a microclimate, which will help to prevent large changes in temperature or humidity around the plates. Finally, all the packages were put into trays made of corrugated blue board with the individual wells made to help prevent the photographs from sliding around. The trays also helped to move the plates within the uh, library and kept the tin types together as a collection. It is easier to access specific plates and just it made handling overall easier. So the collection is now stable enough for future access and study. They can be safely handled and viewed from both sides without risk of further flaking and loss. We really valued how this project enabled collaboration with photo, objects, paper, preventive, and library conservators, as well as with contemporary artists. It really embodied how collaborative and multifaceted a conser conservation treatment can become. Modern tintype photography is alive and well, with artists continuing to explore the limits of what can be done with wet plate collodion. Exploring both historic and contemporary photography was also an opportunity for us to just marvel at the innate humanness and universality of the, of the photograph and what it can capture. 
And thank you so much for tuning in today. We're happy to take questions. Okay, so thank you so much for your presentation. I would just remind, yes, round of applause, Gary. It's the clapping is always hard in a virtual environment, but <laughs> round of applause for you. I would remind everybody that we are being recorded. However, you are welcome to either unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in the chat and I would be happy to read it for you. Gary, would you like to start while everyone either looks for their unmute button or types in the chat? <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, I, I, I just want to congratulate you on this project. I think, it, you know, it's really, you it did a great job with the tintypes, but also uh, uh, explaining what you did in a, in a very clear manner. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you when one of the one of you mentioned uh, that some contemporary tintype artists are using stainless steel plates. I've heard of uh, people using aluminum plates, um, but and one of the ideas behind that was that they they don't attract a magnet, so they can't be confused with a historic plate. Uh, but uh, have you seen people also using stainless steel? Uh, I will uh, own up to that as that was a miss. I misspoke on that one. Um, I should have said aluminum instead of stainless steel. So <laughs> you were you are you are very correct. That was a uh, a miss uh, slip of the tongue on my part. Sorry about that. No problem. I, I recently had a tin type made of myself, and it, it's on aluminum. So that's why I'm, I was thinking about that. I'll I'll do, let somebody else ask a question. Hey, again, you can feel free to unmute yourself and just shout out in case I don't see the hand raise emoji or anything. Just, you know, unmute yourself and shout out or type it in the chat. I'm looking, I'm looking. You were so thorough uh, that people can't think of a question. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask another one. Um, in 18, I think it was 18, around 1870, uh, the chocolate tintypes were introduced. Uh, there were three three different uh, tones that you could the photographer could purchase of uh, varying shades of uh, a warm warm tones uh, as opposed to the original tintype process, which was a very cool black and white tone. Uh, were any of the tintypes you worked on? Did they have any? Did you find that any of them had a a natural brown tint that was not the result of some aging process? Um, I think the tintype collection that we worked on exclusively, the, the lacquer was kind of a black lacquer, so it had kind of a darker tone. I, I myself haven't encountered very many of the, the warmer tone chocolate tintypes, but I have heard of them. They sound really, really gorgeous. Yeah, they're nice. Um, the other thing with tintypes is that you know, they start out as a wet plate collodion process that, that you described, but there was also a dry collodion process that was used by some tintype artists, especially people like on the boardwalk at the shore and places where, um, you know, it, it was harder to have a dark room nearby. Um, they, they they tended to be early 20th century, but the ones that, that you worked on, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but they look like they're earlier maybe 1880s is that is that your feeling about them yeah we suspect 1880s or possibly 1890s mm -hmm. yeah we just had uh kind of to guess based on dress and kind of the the tone of them as well okay. but you said one of them had a label uh what was what did the label tell you uh unfortunately it was uh very uh, illegible. I could make out a few letters of what was presumably the studio. And uh, that's when I did uh, some basic research and found that there was a studio by that name in Philadelphia at the appropriate time. So okay. uh, unfortunately, it was a uh, quite deteriorated label. Yeah, the, re the, the metal plate on the, the back of that was exposed. So it was 
there was a lot of uh, rust and corrosion on the plate, which really damaged the, the label on the back, which is unfortunate. I think maybe with maybe some digital manipulation of the image, we might be able to more clearly make out some of the text to learn more about it, which would be really great to pursue in the future. There were, there were only a couple of black photographers in Philadelphia in the 19th century. Um, did, were you able to determine if the one that you were that you identified was made by a black photographer? Uh, we weren't able to uh, definitely confirm that. I think that would require more more closer research down the line, examining in, in the examination of confirmed photographs from specific studios. I just mentioned that on my website. Uh, Soretsky.com, there's a list of pretty much all the 19th century Philadelphia photographers with the dates and addresses. So if you have a name, you could look it up and see, you know, if that person's listed and what years they were in operation. Okay, that's a that's a fantastic resource. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely have to follow up on that. Okay. All right, I have some questions in the chat now I that have, I can I read. have a question. Oh. Um, this, I'm Jessica Myers, and not real sure how to make my face uh, visible. But anyway, how did it begin? How did you two get together on this project? I mean, uh, it's a wonderful presentation. I just can't imagine doing one part of it. and. I don't know. W weren't you at different places or something? Um, we we were both still um, in the second year of our graduate studies at Winterthur, so we were both still on site at the Winterthur um, Museum and Library. So we so were, you were both at Winterthur. Yeah, we were both at Winterthur, and it was just kind of by chance that the timing worked out, and that Winterthur had just acquired that collection, and that we were we had we were able to work on that. We had the time and the space and the resources to devote some time for that project. It's, it's really fantastic. Way different level of graduate school than I had. <laughs> but um, I really, uh, Gary should keep track of where you guys are because a wonderful resource um, of things I didn't know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Let's let's uh, address the questions in the chat. Okay, so I'm probably going to get some pronunciations wrong here, but this question says, thanks for your presentation. My question is around treatment. Did you run into any issues of the Toulon solubilizing any of the varnishes? And you can look in the chat, Katerina and Johanna, if I've butchered that beyond recognition. <laughs> Um, we didn't uh, really run into any issues with that. Of course, we were, we were concerned about the toluene since it is such a aggressive solvent, but we did some testing, like we said, on the um, study collection. And thankfully, we were using such small amounts and being really careful to feed under kind of specific flakes as best we could that we were able to avoid uh, dr kind of a drastic exposure to the solvent. Okay. Katarina, did you want to weigh in on that or shall I move on to the next one? Um, no, I guess uh, just to also emphasize that when we were applying the toluene in, in Paraloid B72, we were never like directly applying it onto the surface of the tin type. So it was it was just to like expose the exposed metal and just where there were cracks and areas of loss. So yeah, to just we were limiting the, the exposure to the, the photograph and its layers as much as possible. This yeah, we were, we question. relied on. Oops, sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. I was, we were relying basically on capillary action to draw the solvent from the bare metal to uh, under the cracks. So. I think one of one of the major points to get across for the, those in the audience who are not conservators is that the only thing that you found that was safe to clean a tintype with was was water. And. You should definitely not use other things like al anything with alcohol because that dissolves collodion and takes the image layer off. I found that out. 
So this next question builds off that first one from a different listener. Why did you decide to use the toluene specifically? And did you also test paraloid in acetone? Um, yeah, we did also test uh, paraloid in acetone and also ethanol and a few other solvents. And we did find that um, toluene ended up having the, the best kind of balance of the flow and to where it was being um, a, con it was consolidating the flaking areas really effectively, and it was also evaporating quite quickly. We were also um, relying a lot on sort of previous research done on tin type consolidation, and we have found in our in our conversations also with uh, photo conservators that they had been they had found the toluene and paraloid B seventy two to be pretty pretty successful. Okay, Johanna, did you want to say anything or shall I move on to the next one? Um, no, I think that about sums it up. As okay. we mentioned, uh, we didn't really want to use toluene given how toxic it was, but it really did work the best okay. out of all the things we tested. This next comment says, thank you so much for the wonderful and informative talk. Did you decide to store the tin types flat in trays because of the housing technique you chose for accessibility? Is there a best practice for storage of tin types, horizontal versus vertical? Um, we there there were several considerations I think into choosing how we house them. Um, probably the best practice is to have them stored horizontally because that prevents gravity basically from pulling any flakes off the surface that might not have been fully attached. Um, and also we were basically fitting them back into an existing box. Um, as you may know, archives, there's space is always at a premium. And so we wanted to make sure that they went back into the space that they had already occupied. Okay. Here's a question in the chat. Where did you get the Z cases? So we made uh, the Z trays individually, each by hand. They're uh, made out of square sheets of mylar, which um, were folded to fit each uh, tin type. Um, because each of the tin types aren't, they're each a different uh, size and shape. None of them were ex exactly sh square. We, it was, we kind of had to do each individually by hand to make sure each one would fit nicely in its housing. And we kind of based our design off of um, sort of diagrams we had seen, um, I think with the, through the George Eastman house, when they, for their, for um, sealed packages for daguerreotype photographs, and also from previous um, housing collections that had done with uh, photographs in Winterthur's collection, just to try to keep uh, things consistent with how they were storing materials. Okay, I'm not seeing any further questions in the chat. Anyone else want to unmute and ask a question? I think yeah. you have a question here. Uh, I, yeah, thank, thanks Kat and thanks Joe. This great presentation, well done. I, I wanted to build on the, the Z um, trap or trade question, did you guys consider that, you know, certain kind of materials coming next to the tin type, like for some photographs, you know, we keep, you know, there the pH balance is in consideration and all that other kind of stuff. We're making a closed environment for micro environments. Did you guys think about any concerns that you might have for like what you're creating in, in this kind of little enclosure or any concerns? Cause you had rust. Um, yeah, the materials we used for the housing were all um, neutral materials. And then we also did not enclose any materials until we felt felt pretty sure that if there was anything that needed to off gas, like say trace solvent or something, that that was not going to be locked into the sealed package for the end of time. And that the cases themselves, if if need be, they can also be um disassembled. I think um, with with tin types, because 
they are so sensitive to environmental conditions, really a sealed package is kind of an ideal way to store them. If you can't necessarily have really strict um, environmental controls over materials. So we did think it was a, a great option to house these materials while also still enabling them to be handled and viewed from both sides since they were double-sided. Did I hear someone else trying to get a question in before Dawn went? Gary, maybe that was you. Did you have another one? No, I think I I asked mine. Okay. Well, I see lots of thank yous and kudos in the chat. This was a fascinating talk. Um, Katerina, Johanna, or Gary, any last thoughts before we wrap up? No, just uh, I want to convey my thanks um, on behalf of the Princeton Preservation Group that you two took the time to prepare this excellent presentation, and we hope that you'll attend some of our future meetings. Thank you yeah. for having us. Definitely. Thank you so I much. I guess I do have, I have one more question, and sorry, sorry for interrupting. I think slowly. Um, do you, have you, are you publishing this? Uh, because you should. I mean, this is a wonderful uh, amount of information at two sites. So um, let us know, or let us, maybe Melissa could tell us if anything is uh, going to be the next step for your work, even though you're in different, well, different places. Yeah, Katarina Thanks. and Johanna, if you wind up publishing anything, I could certainly send it to everyone who registered for tonight's presentation. Thanks. Yeah, that, that would be wonderful. I think one of the things that Joe and I both noticed during our research is that we were wishing that there was more published information out there. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, We'll see you at the next one. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.